Let's, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the gift of marriage, this institution that you have given to your creation, that creation may be blessed uh, by, by marriage and by all the blessings that attend to it. We pray that you would bless the marriages of the people of Beautiful Savior, and we pray that you would sanctify marriage uh, in this place. We pray all of this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, uh, so just continuing on with marriage, uh, we've been doing what God intends for marriage. Hopefully we can kind of finish that up tonight and maybe even get a little bit to who's in charge. Um, so small housekeeping bit is uh, just that I'm going to be gone. Uh, I'll be driving back from Wisconsin next Wednesday, so... Um, uh, no, no class next Wednesday, and then I, I'm hoping to be able to show that movie between next uh, next week and then when I leave again in at the end of August. So hopefully we can kind of wrap up this marriage stuff and get uh, to to that, uh, which would be ideal. I I don't know if we'll finish everything tonight, but um, all right. Oh, goodness. All right. Um, so, last time we left off, right at the kind of end of procreation. So, who watched the video? Who watched, Who did their homework? Anyone? Oh, I had company. I'm, I'm disappointed. Oh, Steve did. I watched it before. Oh, okay. He'd watched it before. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's no problem. Uh, there's always time. So, I'll write down the thing again in case you need it. It's a... Uh, yeah, yeah. If you just if you just YouTube it, you can find it. Um, I have a little link here, uh, tinyurl.com/coonsfertility, uh, because honestly, the topic is um, it's just almost too big to cover in in this class since we're trying to go through every kind of touch on every aspect of being Lutheran uh, during this class and. Um, this is more of a, a, a special, unique topic that would maybe take too long to dive down into. But um, So anyway, that video is really good. But basically what I'll say is... Uh, I keep losing my marker. Oh, here it is. Um, that, first of all, keep in mind what we've talked about multiple times, which is that... Uh, especially in a thing like marriage where society is constantly changing its mind about it, what, what society thinks about it and what's acceptable societally for marriage, um, the church can easily end up with blind spots where we kind of go along with the culture for a little bit and don't realize that we've maybe sacrificed something biblically. So when we talked about, uh, and the thing that we need to do about that is to always keep an open mind to what the scriptures say and be willing to uh, be corrected by the scriptures, right? So um, anyhow, what the scriptures say about procreation is, first of all, that it's a good thing, right? Psalm 127, 128, uh, children are a blessing from the Lord. Uh, the Lord is the one who builds the house. Um, if you do watch this video, Kuntz's main point in his paper, his thesis, is that f- fertility should be left up to God, not to us. Because uh, God is the one who gives fertility to begin with in Genesis uh, chapter 1, right? These things reproduce according to their kinds. And uh, fertility uh, is not... So So there can be um, different ways that people will kind of struggle with fertility. And uh, one of those ways is not actually necessarily denying children, but some, some people who have trouble having children will go to extreme measures, probably too extreme of measures at times uh, to, to have children, um, right? Some, uh, with a lot of the medical practices out there now, um, I mean, adoption is good, right? We, we like adoption uh, because that's, God commands us to take care of the orphans, and that's giving a child a home without a home. That's that's different. But um, 
when people will have all sorts of procedures done and go through routes like surrogacy uh, to, to get children um, if they are, have not been naturally given them, because it is true that naturally some people cannot have children uh, due to God not giving them that gift, right? Barrenness is a uh, common problem in the Bible, right? Sarah is barren, uh, Rebecca, um, yeah, Rebecca is barren, and uh, so on and so forth. There's all these barren women in the Bible. And then uh, it's a blessing when God gives them, uh, restores them from being barren, but that doesn't always happen. And so people can uh, become, try and become a god over their own fertility, if you will, uh, in that way too, all right? Um, and that actually is what Abraham does, right? Uh, it's just a, what Abraham does with, uh, Sarah and with um, what's her name? Ishmael's mom. Uh, uh, Hannah? What? Hannah? No, it's not no, Hannah. It's a name. Um, it's not a real common anyway, the the uh, the maid right? yeah the maid servant. Yeah. Uh, she she's nothing more than a. It's just a more um, Hagar. Hagar. Thank you. Uh, Hagar is is just a. Um, more primitive form of surrogacy, right? Um, now it removes the, the physical act of uh, conjugal love between the, the man and the, and the um, surrogate mother uh, via scientific methods, but that doesn't make it any less kind of adulterous, right? Um, to, that, to go outside of the marriage to get um, this thing. And I, there's also a lot of problems with IVF, um, in vitro fertilization, um, IVF, the process is to fertilize a lot of eggs, which we would say are babies because a fertilized egg is conception and life begins at conception. And then uh, to try and use one or two of those to um, make the mother pregnant uh, through you know, uh, artificial uh, what, it, what do they call it? Putting it into the uterus anyway. Im- implantation. Um, implantation. And then the question is always, well, what happens with all those other fertilized eggs? What happens with all those other babies? And they just freeze them in some laboratory. And as Christians, we would say, well, that's not a uh, good practice either. Um, in fact, that's a sinful practice to, to make babies and then not to uh, raise them, to put them into a freezer. Um, and what are we going to do with all these frozen babies one day? Um, that's a very big ethical dilemma. So pro, uh, when it comes to procreation, my point is that people can become try and become a god of their fertility. Um, I think the ob- I mean the the more obvious side of this is birth control, which gets talked about more often. But I want to point out to start with that you can fall off the ditch on either side of this. Um, the point that I want to drive forward is that God is the one who's in charge. God is the God of someone's fertility, right? So if God gives a couple, a married couple, 11 children, that's up to God. If he gives a married couple five children, that's up to God. If he gives a couple zero children or one child, that's up to God. And um, this has not been taught on, right? This is one of these, I think, blind spots. This has not been taught on in the church for the last five, six decades, okay? Uh, When birth control came out, uh, in especially in pill form in the 70s, there were other forms of birth control before that. Uh, When birth control came out, the church kind of remained silent and didn't really think through it theologically. The church has really begun to think through this theologically. And I think when you think through it theologically, biblically, and you look at Genesis 1 and 2, and you look at uh, how um, the Bible talks about marriage, 1 Corinthians 7, how husband and wife should be together, uh, how the Bible talks about children, Psalm 127, 28, the, where, where I come away from is that artificial birth control uh, is wrong. And you may disagree with me on that. 
Um, the church, again, the church has not really taught on this in a while. And so a lot of, I've even talked to people who say their pastors told them it was good to use birth control. And so I can't fault people for listening to their pastors, right? But um, when I counsel young couples, uh, I tell them I think this is what the Bible says about children, the procreation and the raising of children. And I think to prevent the natural fruit of the one flesh union is wrong, um, to purposefully prevent it. So uh, I'll, I'll kind of just leave you with that. Again, if you want to um, read more on that or think more on that, uh, then uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to listen to that, that talk. He goes much deeper into every single passage and the overarching theology of this uh, issue of birth control and fertility. But um, when we're asking the question, what does God intend for marriage? Uh, it seems pretty evident biblically that he intends for procreation. Now, uh, so first of all, so first of all, again, if you kind of, if that kind of makes you go, oh, that's, I've never heard that before, or, um, or I can't believe that pastor is saying such crazy things. <laughs> um, again, we kind of remember what we talked about and also remember that um, if anyone is ever convicted by these things, the gospel covers sins of the past, right? God remembers our sins no more. He buries them into the depths of the sea. And uh, so if you read the Bible and you come to a conclusion that this is a sin, and this isn't just for, I'm not just talking to everyone sitting here for the sake of the camera and YouTube and I guess the whole internet. Um, if you're convicted by, by what I'm saying, uh, then know that the gospel is is for you as well, right? So, um, again, this is just one of these blind spots that we have to recognize. Oh, um, maybe the Bible does say something about this uh, the way the way it is. So, um, all right. And then the the other the the other thing connected to that is remember this is two parts. Um, it's procreation, but it's also the raising of children, right? So. Uh, I think sometimes in these birth control conversations um, and, and you get uh, people who will um, make fun of the quiverful Baptists, as they're called, or they call themselves, that agree that birth control is, is wrong um, and have you know, lots and lots of kids. Uh, people will say, well, you're not really caring for those children because... Uh, if you really cared for for children, you wouldn't have so many. You'd be more responsible, and you would, you know, you'd focus on raising uh, maybe two or three of them instead of trying to raise eleven. And what about the financial cost and all of this? Well, I would just say, well, the Bible doesn't tell us to stop uh, caring for children once they're born. Um, we are also commanded to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord and to care for them and provide for them. And so as a, as a father, um, I'm going to do whatever it takes to follow that biblical command as well, right? Um, I'm not just, it's not a competition, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to have as many children as I can. Um, I am being married and receiving as many blessings as God gives me, which is the way that it's framed in the Bible, and then I'm seeking to follow the command to raise those blessings in the fear and admonition of the Lord as much as I can. And uh, I think when you think about it that way, it's not this numbers game, right? I think uh, the, this is one issue in our society is that we think of everything as this zero-sum game. This is kind of a... I really like to use this language to talk about this, but you all have an idea of what, you know what a zero-sum budget is? I've not heard that. Okay, so you know what like a zero-sum zero uh, budget is when you budget every single dollar that comes in, right? So um, you have, say you have a paycheck and it's $2,000 and you are going to put you know, $200 to the church um, and you're going to put uh, $100 into retirement fund 
and so on and so forth, and three hundred dollars to the grocery bill, and in this economy, you know, five hundred dollars to gas, and you know, so on and so forth, until all this, until you get to the end, right? And anything that is left over, you you fit somewhere, right? You're going to budget this somewhere. If there's any extra, I'm going to put it in retirement. If there's any extra, I'm going to help pay off the mortgage early, right? Whatever. So basically, it's zero sum, right? You want to get you want to get to the sum zero. Uh, the other way to think about this is like a pie, right? Where um, there's only so much pie, and it's all it's all going somewhere. So if uh, person one gets a slice that's a fourth of the pie, um, that means and uh, that means that person two uh, say and then say you know this is all taken up by persons two, three, four, and five. Person six only gets this much, right? Um, he might have wanted this much, but he only gets this much because there's only so much pie. Right, so the idea is that we think of everything in life uh, as a zero-sum game. That, well, if if this person gets this much, then that means this person gets less, and that is not actually how God's blessings work. So um, that when when I, the whenever world population comes up, um, I always think of this because. The amazing thing about people is God's creation does not, well, in general, with people and with the rest of God's creation, it doesn't work on a zero-sum basis, right? It grows, and people grow, right? So one phrase that I've heard people use is that children are born with one mouth and two hands. So yes, you have to feed those mouths, for a time, but then they become productive members of society, and they give to society, and they give to their family, and they and and they give blessings. They give. This is why children are a blessing, is because ultimately humans give more than they receive, um, and so it's not zero sum because you're able to actually put out more than you take in, and uh, this is true with all God's creation. This is why world population simply can't be a problem is because, well, one, God is the God of creation. He commands his creation to be filled. And so biblically it's wrong. Two, uh, you have to drive across Iowa and realize it's not a problem. Three, um, humans are productive people and are actually very good at taking care of themselves uh, and and stewarding God's creations when they actually put their minds to it, um, and can can be productive and can produce and can can build better societies. When people get together in groups and build society, it's really kind of an amazing thing, right? Um, and so, world population really can't be a problem. And even within a family, having more of God's blessings, having more people made in the image of God. It, it simply can't, at the end of the day, be a problem, right? You might have to do things differently financially. You might not get to have the highest standard of living that you want to have, but um, that that's not necessarily a problem, right? So, uh, yeah, zero zero sum game I, I find pretty important because uh, we tend to think of um, a lot of things that are actually based on God's grace, which is not a zero-sum game. God's grace grows. Uh, we tend to think of God's gr- things that are based on God's grace as um, a zero-sum game. And uh, this is what I try and like instill this in my children whenever they like fight over attention or want everything to be fair. Like, oh, he got to do this, I want to do this, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, uh, one, life's not fair. That's not a lesson you need to learn. But two, I don't love any of you less, you know, because you get uh, different things at different times, right? My love as a father for children is not a zero-sum game, right? I can have, the love is infinite. Um, same thing is true with God's grace and God's forgiveness. Um, it's not a, a zero-sum game. 
that that's also the that's kind of the problem with the Calvinist view of salvation, is that it's a zero sum game. God kind of only had so much forgiveness to give, and He decided who He was going to give it to, and then you know some people are out of luck, <laughs> right? So um, anyway, all right. So uh, that's procreation, raising of children. Um, oh, my other example about zero sum game is you can tell God's creation is not a zero sum game if you look at nature. Um, have, how many of you have ever cut open a tomato? Right? How many tomato seeds are in one tomato? Right? This is how God's creation works: is uh, things grow and multiply, and they're they're infinite in their in His grace to give that to His children. Right? So, um, okay. Anyhow. Does that make sense? Zero sum game? All right. They probably have more money because his was the first child was the one that took all the pictures of him, you know. <laughs> That's true. Just ask my my sister who's the third child. She said, There aren't any baby pictures. <laughs> she still says it. It might be a little true, you know. <laughs> that we might have more pictures of Matthias than others. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. After you have three. I always tell you know, sometimes my lovely wife gets a little worried that we don't have as many pictures as we used to, and I just tell her, well, just thank God you were born after 1800, you know, <laughs> since we have cameras now. I don't have pictures of my, you know, four times great-grandfather, but it's okay. Um, all right. Uh, the next thing is conjugal love and devotion. So I'm using this language specifically, and I actually want to give a little excursus here um, on language. So we live in an over-sexualized culture, right? You can't, like the example I always use is unless it's January or February, if you walk into Target, you're going to see soft porn because you're going to see bathing suit models, um, which used to simply not be the case. And I think every year they add another month of when they're selling swimsuits, uh, which is, is pretty amazing. Um, even in Mississippi, you can't swim all year round. Uh, but Target, you know, wants you to see that. So we live in an over-sexualized culture, right? Porn is ubiquitous. Soft porn especially is ubiquitous. And uh, we have this problem now of people hitting puberty way, way younger than they ever did before because they're so um, experienced with uh, being around things that are sexual in nature. And I think about that when I read the Bible because the Bible is not over-sexualized. The Bible talks about sexual things, but when the Bible talks about sexual things, it talks about things uh, modestly. So Ephesians uh, 5, 4, um, if you read Ephesians 5, 4, I can read it if I get it open here. There we go. Uh, Obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking are also out of place. Instead, give thanks. Okay, and the verse before that, Uh, Verse 3, but do not let sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed even be mentioned among you as is proper for saints. Obscenity, foolish talk, and coarse joking are also out of place. Instead, give thanks. So that's Paul's advice for how to talk about things. Um, And he makes the point that crude joking is out of place for Christians, right? Coarse joking, crude joking. And it is specifically in the context of sexual immorality, right? And so the way that we talk about these things does matter. And um, I find that when the Bible talks, it's very, uh, it's kind of beautiful the way the Bible talks about these things because Christians should talk about these things, right? We should talk about marriage. We should talk about the one flesh union. We should talk about procreation, Um. And that, this is one of the reasons, back to that procreation stuff, this is one of the reasons I think this kind of became a blind spot is because we, as the culture was being over-sexualized, 
people also become more private about these things, right? So uh, in the sense that um, if you think about in the kind of post-sexual revolution culture, like homosexuality and, and even abortion and these things, what's, what's one of the things they always talk about? The right to privacy, right? That what I do behind closed doors is my business. In other words, basically, I can do whatever sexual deviancy that I want to do, and you can't tell me otherwise. Um, and because it's all, it's all very privatized, right? Um, in other words, there's not a common moral way of talking about these things. And uh, when the Bible talks about these things, it's actually kind of beautiful because it doesn't, by not being too uh, coarse or too crude, it doesn't become something that people are ashamed to talk about, right? So whenever, um, if I start using words that are crude when it comes to um, sexual things, um, or as I'm actually going to try and advocate, we use the word conjugal, then everyone gets a little weirded out, right? I mean, um, and when, when I'm around uh, people that are crude jokers, right, it's kind of like, it, there's something that's just like, I don't really want to, I don't really want to talk about that, like that's, that's between me and my wife, you know, like we, let's not, uh, let's not talk about that. Um, and, uh, this, sometimes when people see that we're, me and Rebecca are young and that we have four kids, they'll ask, you have four kids. Don't you know how that works? Like my response is, yeah, and I'm good at it, but that's, that's, that's not a, that's actually not a good response because it's it's crude joking. But like really, my inside is like, um, that's that's be, that's belongs to my bedroom. Like please please don't, you know. Um, so anyway, uh, the Bible doesn't speak of these things in a crude way. Um, so anyway, I'm just gonna tell you how the Bible speaks of them. So when it comes to good, uh, let let's just say sexuality, um, the Bible uses metaphors. And so you can uh, think about the Song of Songs, uh, which is very much about what happens in a marriage in the one flesh union, but it describes everything metaphorically, right? In this kind of nature, beautiful way that isn't, you can read it to children and they're not going to be offended, right? Uh, They're not even going to really blush, um, maybe at some point a little bit, but uh, it's not at all, I mean, it's God's ordained word and it's very modest in the sense that it, they take it, the Song of Songs takes it very metaphorically. Uh, to give a specific example, even in the New Testament, um, the word that um, is used for the one flesh union or for the, uh, the con- act of conjugal love is, uh, is koite, um, which I think the, even the scientific world has sometimes uses the word coitus. Um, but the, what this word is, is bed, right? So Paul will simply say the marriage bed in 1 Corinthians 7 when he talks about how husbands and wives should take care of this issue in marriage. He just says the marriage bed, uh, which is a very nice way to say it, right? Um, it's not at all crude. Uh, it, it gets the point across, uh, and, it, and it's uh, very modest. Um, in the book that I've been reading for some of this stuff, which was published in the 1930s, uh, which I mentioned to you before, which I lost my copy. I don't know where it went. Uh, one of you stole it. I don't know. Um, do you? Oh, don't, don't worry about it. You don't have to get it right now. You can show me up. Oh, okay. I must have. Uh, yeah, it's a big fat book. Uh, it's called um, "For Better, Not for Worse" uh, by Walter by Walter Meyer. Anyway, um, he uses the word conjugal, and uh, this is a nice word. Uh, now, you might think of like conjugal prison visits, but the the word is nice because it is Latin for uh, you can kind of see it con together, um, and it's 
one become uh, uh, one join to shoot one one become two I believe. Um, let me just make sure. Oh yeah, join together. That's what it means. It means join together, which is what the Bible says, right? The two shall become one. They shall be joined together, and uh, the husband should leave his father and mother and become one with his wife, uh, one flesh. Uh, so that join together is, a ni- I think, a nice way to say it, that um, what is the joining together in a marriage, how is marriage consummated um, in the marriage bed, right? And so this is, when we talk about conjugal love, this is the love of being joined together and the devotion of being joined together. Okay, so anyway, that's the language I'm going to use. Um, oh, I guess I had a couple more things on this language. Um, so when the the Bible uses the terms like sexual immorality and um, and then adultery, I was just going to tell you a little bit about those words too. So sexual immorality, um, that that is, that's an okay translation because it is fairly modest. Um, and I think the word sexual can tend to be kind of modest, although like because we live in such an over-sexualized culture, you don't know what comes into people's minds when you say sexual, but it is what it is. Um, but the word there is actually porneia. Uh, sexual immorality is porneia. And that is connected to, um, it's actually a pretty bland word before the advent of pornography, which is obviously where they get that root from, is a it's a Greek root, but it's actually um, connected to the word to buy or to sell, and it has to do with um, buying or selling prostitutes. Um, and so sexual immorality is connected to the term basically for, it's basically the term for prostitution, um, although it becomes a much broader category uh, than that as the history of the word develops. Um, so pornographic or, uh, is, is actually connected to that, that idea. Um, but the point is that pornographic things or sexual, sexually immoral things, it's treating the human body like a consumer object instead of being conjugal love, joined together marriage love, Right? So those two things are opposite from one another. Um, and then adultery um, literally just means to alter, right? So sometimes we even use this term adultery um, to talk about something that has been altered in a bad way, even when you're not even talking about something sexual. So like, um, in the, like an unadultered text is a text, like a book that has not been changed, right? So... Um, And the point there is that adultery, you're changing your marriage into something it shouldn't be, right? So you're changing changing wives when you shouldn't change wives, or you're changing husbands when you shouldn't change husbands. So um, something something has been altered in the marriage in a a bad way. Um, So even that, you can kind of see those are like more technical terms instead of um, like gross terms or crude terms. So... Anyway, I, I, think, I think it's important to think about how the Bible speaks about things because then that should inform how we speak about things as well. Um, and I think in our over-sexualized culture, it's easy to, to fall into speaking about things the wrong way because um, that actually leads to thinking about things the wrong way, right? The way we think, the way we speak affects the way we think. So uh, anyhow, but this is what God intends for marriage is that... Uh, People would be joined together in conjugal love. Um, And there's always this debate throughout Christian history about how much of marriage, the the marital act, the marriage bed, how much of the marriage bed is about procreation, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, and how much of it is about uh, the pleasure of conjugal love and devotion to one another. Um, because obviously both those aspects are there. And the monks got really big on this, right? The monks thought um, that if there's any pleasure at all, then that's sinful, because we're 
supposed to they they you know they're fine with procreation um, in the world, but they thought you know we we have to suffer. Uh, the Christian life is about suffering, and um, if if we have pleasure, that's going to cause us to think thoughts that are not pure. Right? They are very big on kind of purity and, and this idea, and they thought that um, any kind of pleasure that came out of the conjugal love or devotion was bad, and that's why they became monks. Um, and they were constantly concerned about any kind of uh, sexual immorality creeping into their lives. And uh, so, I mean, it's kind of a messed up view, right? So you have like extremes of this. Um, and then I think in our society, you have the opposite extreme, right? Where even Christians will say, um, well, the marriage bed, God gave that as a gift. It's all, you know, it's all about devotion to one another. It's all about the pleasure that we find in one another. Um, but the having children part of it doesn't matter, right? So we can prevent the having children part of it without any consequence because it's all just about pleasure. And what I would say is like the little girl in the taco commercial, why not both, <laughs> right? Um, you guys know that commercial? That's like an old like Super Bowl commercial where the, the little girl, it's like a, they're advertising this uh, taco shell that's both soft and crunchy or something. I don't even, I don't even know. They, they say, why shouldn't we have soft tacos or hard tacos? And she says, why not both? But she says it in Spanish anyway. Okay. It's an internet meme from the year 2008, and, you know, anyway. Uh, okay, why not both? Why can't we have, why can't we have both, uh, both these things be part of the marriage bed? Um, and I would say this is what God intends. Um, so if you read Song of Songs, obviously finding pleasure and delight in conjugal love is part of it. Um, if you read Psalm 127, 128, and Genesis 1, and Genesis 2, um, and uh, so on and so forth, procreation is also part of it, right? Both these things are, are what God intends, intends for marriage, uh, that we would find uh, these things. And the other thing I would point out is, again, this is two parts, right? The devotion is also part of it. Um, I mean, we all know that there's, there comes a time when... Uh, hormones slow down and um, the marriage bed is not as active as it was in the beginning and that doesn't mean that you give you kind of give up on finding this kind of uh, intimate delight in one another right there's there's ongoing and this goes back to lifelong monogamy as well there's ongoing devotion to one another um, and these two things are also connected and that the children need this devotion, right? The children need their father and mother to be devoted to one another, um, tied to one another in this lifelong monogamy, uh, so that uh, the children have both a father and a mother, right? Um, the other place also to look um, kind of finally on this point is 1 Corinthians 7. Paul specifically gives the advice to married couples uh, do not stay apart from one another except for a time of short fasting so that you can pray, right? So it's okay to, to stay apart from one another for um, a, a time so long as, you, as it's a time of fasting for prayer, but otherwise married couples who are assumedly physically, you know, able and, and ready, should uh, partake in conjugal love and devotion for one another. It's part of marriage. It's good for marriage. Um, and uh, from a pastoral perspective, um, couples who come to marriage counseling, this is often actually something that is addressed, is uh, they have been neglecting this part of their marriage. Um, and it is actually, it, it's kind of important, right, that I don't want to get too too far into it, but um, even when couples are having a hard time, you always there's there's kind of that to fall back on, right? That this is a a unity that you have with one another, uh, despite maybe being emotionally mad or at, at each other or something like that. So um, that's something that God intends for marriage.
Okay, and then finally, I'll just uh, we'll kind of close on this point, and then we'll do who's in charge next time, and then we'll watch that. Uh, well, we have to cover a little bit about divorce and stuff, but um, the final point is devotion to God. So this kind of is a bookend of the blessing, right? So uh, the all of this is kind of like what marriage looks like. Um, the first thing God intends to give his children in marriage is all these blessings that we talked about. Um, fellowship with one another, uh, you know, um, the, the blessing that marriage is to society, the blessing that uh, marriage is uh, to, the, to the children who have parents who are married, the blessing that uh, marriage is in all these different ways. Well, this is what God gives us, and then kind of looking back to God then, devotion to God is what God also intends for marriage, that man and woman would be united in this marriage and then live the Christian life together, right? Raise Christian children. Um, that uh, if you look at, um, well, also in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's kind of marriage advice section, uh, he says that if marriage is a good thing, um, even when it's a believer and an unbeliever, because if the if the woman is an, a believer and the man is an unbeliever, that man is now blessed because of that woman's devotion to God, right? Because he might be more likely to convert. Um, and so that devotion to God is is what part of what God intends for marriage. It's better if both are believers, however. And um, what was I was also just thinking about... Um, well, let me keep talking about some other things first, and I'll remember. But uh, if you think about also the marriage ceremony, right? Who are the vows made in front of? I mean, first of all, in front of the people there, right? But the idea of having a marriage, a church ceremony, a marriage ceremony, is that you're making vows before who? Before God, right? Um, that that as God is our witness, we're we're making this lifelong monogamous contract with one another. And um, that means that we're going to be devoted uh, to, to God. Um, so uh, one final thing on that, I guess. I was, I was thinking of something else too, but um, is that back to Ephesians 5, marriage is an image of Christ and his church. And when, if marriage is an image of Christ and his church, then when a married couple uh, acts like that in the world, they are witnessing to the world Christ and his church, right? They're with, they, a married couple um, acting in devotion to God, which is acting like Christ and his church. Um, with a with the husband and the head and the the wife as the one who submits, that is a witness to the world of of Christ. And so devotion to God is important in that sense too, because it protects the marriage as a witnessing marriage. Um, so so devotion to God um, is of utmost importance. And of course, you know, we would also just say kind of broadly that Christians know the truth because we have the Bible and. Uh, when we have that clear word, we know what marriage should be, right? The whole point of this topic is biblical marriage, that we want to do what the Bible says, not just any kind of marriage, but bi- biblical marriage, right? Not just as the world defines it, but as, as Christians defined it. And so that God intends that for Christians who know that word, right? Now, God grants marriage to unbelievers, but for Christians, we know best how to act and be and experience marriage. And so let's, you know, do that. Um, all right. That's how I, what I have for God and what God intends for marriage. Uh, any final questions, comments on anything we talked about so far? Yeah, Steve. Yeah, the, uh, like two lines that God at the top, and they're kind of going toward God. 
Now, if both people in the marriage are praising God and doing what God wants, they're getting closer to God. As they get closer to God, they get closer to each other. Now, the ones that uh, don't have God in their life, the lines go this way, away from God, and they get farther apart from each other. Mm -hmm. And that explains why there is a lot of divorce. Yeah, right. And especially as the general culture becomes less Christian, those boundaries that Christian marriage provides are uh, diminished, right? So like with divorce, um, the onset of no-fault no divorce, right? That the, the whole idea of fault divorce is a Christian idea, that there's only a few specific reasons why people should be allowed to get divorced. Otherwise, it's supposed to be a lifelong monogamous marriage. Um, and you can't just go, it's a, it's a true vow before God that you've taken. You can't just go and uh, say that doesn't matter anymore, right? And so when society recognized that, when society said, yeah, that, that's good for society that people can't just get divorced for whatever reason, um, that, was, that was a blessing to society and a blessing to those marriages because that was closer to God's intention for marriage. Uh, now that divorce is no fault and people can get divorced for no reason at all, that is further away from God's intention and society is suffering for it. Right, so I think that's spot on, Steve, that um, when you have a devotion to God within a marriage, you are by nature strengthening the marriage. And then when you don't have devotion to God, you're by nature weakening the marriage. Any other comments or questions? Um, Luther was a monk at one point. Mm -hmm. And so did he ever write anything about how he felt when he was a monk as far as marriage goes? And then how he felt after he married Katie Luther? Yeah, so basically when Luther you know, rediscovered God's word, uh, he realized that it was ridiculous to have uh, the clergy and also you know, large groups of men be celibate uh, out of an attempt of self-justification. So just on clergy marriage really quickly... Um, I don't know how you read the Bible. Like that, maybe the best passage is First Timothy three, which is the um, the um, qualifications for the ministry, for the office of the ministry. And one of the qualifications is that the pastor be a husband of one wife. I don't know how the Catholics really get around that. <laughs> I mean, uh, with clerical celibacy, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, Paul, when he talks in 1 Corinthians 7 about celibacy, he actually says there, this is my own personal uh, advice. This is not actually, it's, um, this is not the, the, like from the word, how does he say it exactly? He says like basically this is not an absolute word from God. This is kind of my personal advice as I'm writing to you when he encourages men to be celibate. Um, I say it as a concession, not as a command, right? Uh, so he says, I, I say this as a concession, not as a command, for I wish that all people were like me, but each person has his own gift from God. One person is blessed in this way, one person in a different way. And I actually think that Paul was married and then widow. He's a, I think he's a widower. Anyway, that's beside the point. But Paul's, Paul's point is, hey, look, I'm a foreign missionary who's constantly being thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. It's probably good that I'm not married so that a wife doesn't have to deal with that. Right? But he says that's not advice for all people. Um, and as we know from history, uh, and I think from Genesis 1 and 2 as well, most people should get married. Um, because most people burn with passion, which is what Paul says next is, it's better to be married than to burn with passion. Most people burn with passion. Most people, um, like I, I know 
two people who basically they're men, um, but their hormones are arranged in such a way that, you know, from God's creation, um, that they are not, they're not not attracted to women, but they don't burn with passion. And those men are celibate pastors. And that's fine. That's great. Right? But most people are not that way. Um, anyway, so that's kind of celibacy. What, what, what was the question? Uh, Martin, Luther. Martin Luther. Yes. So Martin Luther realized celibacy is for a select few. It's not for everybody. And then he also realized all the blessings and gifts of marriage. And I think even though he got married later in life, he had like 12 kids or something um, with, with Katie. Um, and, and he writes a lot about the married life and how much of a blessing it is uh, to be with Katie and to have these children um, and and to, to raise them in the faith. And, uh, yeah, so he does write about it. Um, and uh, he, I, I'm pretty sure when he talks about the issue of procreation versus conjugal love, he says, yeah, it's both. Uh, both are good things. So, um, yeah, I, don't, I, I can't give specifics on where he writes about it. I could find it, but... Um, yeah, that was part of his, that was actually a major part of his really rediscovering the gospel was seeing that the attempts of monk self-justification, uh, were really flawed in that way. Um, and, and also that like these men, they, it didn't stop them from burning with passion. And we know how that is in the Roman Catholic church now, um, that the various problems their priests seem to have over and over again. That they, they keep burning with passion, and uh, so uh, that's that's definitely an issue. Um, and yeah, there's. Well, anyway, I won't go into that because we don't do crude, we don't do crude joking. So, <laughs> um, any other questions, comments? All right, let's end with a word of prayer. Generally, Father, I pray uh, that our hearts and minds would always be open to your word and that we would conform our lives to it always. Pray that you would, again, bless uh, the marriages of your people. Help all married couples to be devoted to you, that they may be an image of Christ and your church. And we pray that you would uh, bless marriage also in our land, that people's hearts would turn, and that uh, marriage would be Uh, holy and regarded as sacred in this place. We pray all this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.